Alright folks, this is Mr. O'Brien. Welcome to the video quiz about Adams and Jefferson. The name of this presentation is Launching a New Republic, the years 1797 through 1809. It's the second Launching a New Republic video. And again, specifically, it's the presidencies of Adams and Thomas Jefferson, John Adams. Alright, so in the 1796 election results, which were for the presidency that begins in 1797, uh, we have John Adams winning uh, as a Federalist and Thomas Jefferson uh, becoming his vice president as a Democrat-Republican. Remember, back then it was whoever came in second became the vice president. All right. So, reading from the notes underneath, the election of 1790... Sorry. The election of 1796 was the first contested presidential election. John Adams with Thomas Pinckney of South Carolina ran for the Federalists, and John, I'm sorry, Thomas Jefferson, with Aaron Burr of New York, ran for the Republicans. Although Adams won the presidency with the most electoral votes, Jefferson received more votes than Pinckney, so he became Adams' VP. Adams was brilliant but disliked by nearly everyone, even his supporters, and his administration faced constant crisis. Although the U.S. was neutral in the war between France and Britain, it defended its rights, its right to trade with both nations. In 1797, before negotiating the renewal of France's treaty with the U.S., French officials demanded bribes. Outraged, Adams publicized the affair, uh, and soon the U.S. and France were engaged in a quasi-war at sea. Quasi-naval war. America had effectively become an ally of Great Britain in the European War. In the 1800s, Adams negotiated a peace with France. Um, this became known as the XYZ Affair. So, to make a long story short, as you already know, when France has the French Revolution, they wind up with a war with Britain, against monarchy, yada yada. They expect our help. We're not giving it. Uh, the American people, for the most part, and the, the Republicans, the Jeffersonians, support the French. They support the war. They want us to help France. And Washington declared neutrality, and Adams is intent on maintaining that neutrality. So we were at loggerheads with France, and we sent over diplomats to negotiate. I think it was Elbridge Gerry to negotiate in France. And before negotiations began, they demand a bribe. Adams is really annoyed, and he publicizes it. And he refuses to name the actual uh, French diplomats. They're beneath that. So they were known as X, Y, and Z. So that's why it was called the X, Y, Z affair. And after that, we wound up in an undeclared naval war with France, which, as you will see, uh, brings us to the Alien and Sedition Acts, which are pretty significant. All right, uh, you see some other guys here. Sam Adams ran for president. Yes, the John's cousin and the Sam Adams of the beer. Uh, Oliver Ellsworth, George Clinton, again, 7%. I'm sorry, a uh, 5%, seven electoral votes. Uh, none of them came close to winning. All right, you can see the uh, the makeup here. The purple states and portions of states are those that voted for Adams. The Federalist strongholds along the coast. Can you say? Can you say plantations? And uh, the red, more rural, small farmer, voted for Jefferson. So those are the 1796 election results. All right, so now we get to the Adams presidency. A.K.A. or the name Jefferson gave it, and he's that devilishly handsome gentleman you see there. He gave uh, Adams' presidency the nickname the Reign of Witches. All right, so let's look at the notes underneath here. The most controversial act of the Adams administration was the Alien and Sedition Acts, passed by a Federalist-dominated Congress in 1798. The Alien Act made it harder for immigrants to become naturalized citizens and allowed the deportation of immigrants deemed dangerous by federal authorities. Moves meant, and here's the important part, moves by the Federalists that were meant to silence immigrant radicals who supported the Republicans and the French. Execution of assembly or publication critical of the government. This was meant to allow federal authorities to suppress Republican newspapers, that is to say, the Republican or Jeffersonian press, which were a lot of immigrants also, uh, from attacking the Adams administration and its policies. Remember that 
the out-of-power Jeffersonians were highly critical of the in-power Federalists. So this was a, an obvious attempt by the Federalists to basically shut them up. And about 18 were prosecuted under this, 18 people. So Jefferson, referring to the Salem witch trials, believed these acts inaugurated a, quote, reign of witches. More than a dozen individuals were charged with sedition. 18, to be exact many of whom were convicted, including Matthew Lyons, a Republican member of Congress, was convicted. And they're supposed to be immune to s charges of slander when they're in session. Instead of squelching the opposition, the Alien and Sedition Acts provoked more of it by making an issue out of free speech. Madison and Jefferson drafted resolutions to be passed by the Virginia and Kentucky legislatures. Both acts criticized, both resolutions, uh, criticized the acts as violations of the First Amendment, freedom of speech and assembly in the press. The original draft of Jefferson's resolution asserted that states could unilaterally stop the enforcement of such laws within their borders. Borders. The technical word would be to nullify. But the Kentucky legislature, because this was the Kentucky resolution, uh, deleted this passage before passing its resolution. So basically Jefferson and Madison were arguing that it was not the Supreme Court that is the check on Congress and the, the executive branch. It is rather the states. Their argument was basically you can't have the national government check itself. You can't have one branch check the other. There has to be a non. There has to be a check that's not from the national government. And they argued it should be the states, and they have lost this argument, as you will see later on. Jefferson also argued that states, not the federal government, could punish seditious speech. While many Americans were repelled by the idea that states could refuse to follow federal laws, more Americans believed that believed the Alien and Sedition Acts violated protections for free speech enshrined in the Constitution. All right, moving on. This brings us to the uh, the end of Adams' administration uh, in the 1800 election the one that elected Jefferson, which, by the way, he only won because of the three-fifths compromise. And he barely won at that. So you can see Jefferson and Burr are tied. 73 electoral votes each. What to do? Well, the election goes into the House. That's what to do, according to the Constitution. But also, here, here's the thing. Jeffersonians, the Electoral College, the, Jeff the Jeffersonians in the Electoral College messed up. They were supposed to elect Jefferson president and Burr vice president, meaning uh, more of them vote for Jefferson than Burr, but one uh, Jeffersonian dude messed it up, and he voted for Burr by mistake, and they wound up tied. Okay? So it messed up the whole voting process. All right. Uh, John Adams lost in his bid for a second term, uh, only getting 65 electoral votes. All right. And Pinckney and Jay also ran and didn't win. All right, moving on. You can see the Electoral College breakdown. It's kind of the same as it was in the 1796 election. All right, a little less purple, and that's the difference. A little less purple, a little less Adams, a little more Jefferson. All right, maybe right here, maybe right here. Okay. So, if you look at the notes underneath the slide, John Adams's acceptance of defeat established established the precedent of the peaceful transfer of power in the United States. In other words, we were switching from the Federalists to the Jeffersonians, or to the Republicans. And it was being done peacefully. The importance of slavery and the Three-Fifths Compromise was demonstrated. Without slaves counted as part of the South's population, and hence it increased their number of Electoral College votes, Thomas Jefferson would have lost. The election demonstrated the importance of mobilizing large numbers of voters with more modern campaign techniques, which the Republicans effectively employed. So Jefferson himself didn't run, didn't campaign, there was no really campaigning yet, but his party helped him get elected. Moving on. Okay, this is the results in the House of Representatives. So as per the Constitution, if, there, if no candidate gets enough votes to automatically become president, it goes to the House, there were 16 states, Jefferson got 10 of them, Bo uh, Boer. Burr got four of them, and two states abstained. So, this controversy surrounding the whole tie thing 
uh, who, who would be president led to the passage of the 12th Amendment, which changed the operation of the Electoral College. So now we have two separate elections for president and for vice president. Remember, that's the 12th Amendment. All right, slavery and politics. This is so important, there's no picture to go along with it. Reading from the notes underneath. Slavery lurked in the background of debates in the 1790s. Jefferson was elected only because he received all of the South's Electoral College votes. Adams got none. He was anti-slavery. Uh, Jefferson, Jeffersonian liberty rested on the fact that three-fifths of the slaves were counted in apportionment. Again, it increased their number of electoral votes because electoral votes is the number of your House members plus your two senators. So, since the House members are by population, if the slaves count for 60% of a... each slave is 60% of a person, it increases the numbers. If it had been otherwise, Adams would have won. Uh, the first Congress received... by the way, James K. Polk also wins later on because of the same three-fifths compromise. The three-fifths compromise went a great... was a, a big reason for the, the, quote, slave power that dominated national politics up until Abe Lincoln. The first Congress, Congress received petitions for the abolition of slavery, including one signed by Ben Franklin. Madison and other political leaders, even though they found slavery distasteful, believed that it was too divisive to be made an issue in national politics, and they ignored the petitions. Remember, the national government was never able to move if any Congress people or senators, uh, well, if any House members or senators were anti-slavery, they could never really gain enough traction in Congress because uh, the Thrift's Compromise all but guaranteed uh, pro-slavery dominance of, of the national government. All right. Uh, this actually should say the Jeffersonian presidency. I apologize. But this actually happens during the Adams presidency, so I take back my apology. All right. The Haitian Revolution and also uh, Gabriel's Rebellion a.k.a. Prosper's Rebellion, which was his last name. The notes. The Haitian Revolution demonstrated how slavery shaped and warped American freedom. Jeffersonians, who celebrated the French Revolution as an advance for liberty, were horrified by the slave revolt in 1791 in Saint Domingue, France's most treasured colonial possession in Haiti, it was in Haiti, an island of sugar plantations in the Caribbean. The slaves defeated British and French forces sent to suppress the rebellion, and they declared an independent nation in 1804. In fact, the French blockaded Haiti and said, we will not end the blockade till you pay us what you owe us. In other words, you stole our property. You liberated yourselves. You stole our slaves. You stole yourself. Hence the Haitian debt. It begins with this. Remember the, uh, the earthquake years ago, then everybody talked about Haitian debt and how they were so impoverished? It begins here. All right, the revolt affirmed the universal appeal of freedom in this age of revolutions and fostered hopes of freedom among America's slaves. Whites were generally terrified by the specter, the idea, the, the visual of armed slave insurrection, and they interpreted the turmoil in Haiti as a sign, of course, that blacks just could not govern themselves. Wanting that whole freedom thing. Oh. Jefferson's, Jefferson's administration hoped to isolate and destroy the hemisphere's second independent republic. Many white Americans considered Lay Overture's uprising to be evidence of blacks' unfitness for republican freedom, as I said. Notable, the Federalists, while in power, especially Adams, supported the revolution financially. 1800 also saw a slave revolt in America, led by Gabriel Prosser, a Virginia slave, plotting to kill whites on the way to Richmond, where they would hold government officials hostage and demand the abolition of slavery. The slave rebels were discovered, arrested, and many of them executed. They were inspired by the language and symbols of the American Revolution. They invoked their right to liberty, and they compared themselves to George Washington. In response, <laughs> Virginia passed laws that tightened control over the state's blacks. So again, as white people became more afraid, black people became less free. It was that vicious cycle. Rebellion, less freedom. Rebellion, less freedom. It made it more difficult for owners to free their slaves. There were laws prohibiting 
whites down south from, from freeing their slaves and forced free slaves to leave the state or return to slavery. Now 